Hey, welcome back to the Farmville Pharmacy Tech videos. This is going to be week five. If you're watching this video, that means that you enrolled in the online pharmacy technician course. So thank you and congratulations on your path to become a pharmacy technician. Make sure if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. And go ahead and bring some friends on in into this course so you can help each other learn this course as well. All right, so the things that we're going to talk about today is going to be the general anatomy and the physiology. And in your workbook or your manual, that's going to be page 125 to 127. We'll be talking about the analgesics and the COX inhibitors. That's going to be found on page 104 to 115. And then the last part is going to be the three calculation problems you need to know. This will probably be done on a different video, depending on how long the length of this video is going to be. But those can also be found in your book, 175 through 179 and those are going to be the PDF file. So the pages might differ a little bit. All right, so general anatomy and physiology. Physiology is the study of the human body and its organs. If you think of it as circular and interconnected by nature, you can put it into perspective and understand it better. We will describe physiological systems individually, possibly making it seem like each system is independent of the other. Realize, however, that these systems work collectively to create an intelligent living network. So the human body essentially is a collection of tissue, muscle, nerves, and bones. Each is incredibly specialized and complex and always try to maintain a constant state of balance known as homeostasis or equilibrium. When this balance is disrupted, a host of symptoms and ailments may occur whereby medication may be utilized in order to stabilize the disruption. By working through the dynamics of physiology, physiology genetics, biochemistry, etc., drugs can help bring you back to stable homeostasis. Therefore, when trying to comprehend medicinal effects, we must understand our human physiology first. Every human body is different, thus we know why some drugs work better than others and why some have more side effects than others. How these anatomical systems relate will also aid in your understanding of what certain drugs can do for different disease states. The following is an overview of the anatomical systems. Once finished, we will then review drug classifications and how they relate to our physiology. So the first one is going to be called the integumentary system. This system consists of the skin, nails, hair, and sweat glands. These tissues protect your body from pathogens, bacterium, aid in water retention, temperature regulation, and production of vitamin D precursors. The skeletal system. This system consists of bones, cartilage, and joints, which form a framework and structure necessary for motion. It is also responsible for bodily support, red blood cell production, which is the oxygen carrier of the body, and mineral fat storage. So the parts that you're going to want to know, well, for the integument system, you're going to want us to know that it consists of the skin, nails, hair, and sweat glands. And for the skeletal system, you're going to want us to know that it consists of the bones, cartilage, and joints. Now the muscular system. The muscles adhere to the bones and give us range of movement. With its flexing, it produces energy with body heat being a byproduct. More so, this system contains a smooth muscles, such as inner organs, which are involuntarily regulate by the nervous system, while our skeletal muscles are voluntary. Now, it's important to know the difference between the involuntary and the voluntary muscles. Involuntary is going to be like your heart beating, you can't control it, or it might be your liver, how your livers work. And then voluntary would be as if you were to flex your arm or lift it up and down. That would be considered voluntary because that's what you're choosing to do. You cannot choose when the involuntary muscles work and do not work. The nervous system. This system consists of the brain, spinal cord, and an almost infinite amount of sensory receptors. It is a fluid electrical network of neurons and signals firing milliseconds apart and is one of the most clandestine systems of the body. Its receptors are responsible for specialized senses ranging from hearing to touching. It tracks external sensations while orchestrating movement, physiological processes, voluntary and involuntary, and is responsible for our cognition. 
So without the brain, spinal cord, and the sensory receptors, you wouldn't be anything. So those are, those are good to know that those are inside the nervous system. The endocrine system. The endocrine system is made up of numerous glands which secrete hormones and other associated substances. It controls vital functions of the body such as reproduction, growth, and metabolism. In recent years, science has been able to synthesize hormones and control different aspects of their production which can be used by the human body. The glands in the endocrine system include the pituitary, adrenals, thyroid, thymus, pancreas, testes, and ovaries. So it's going to be important for this system to know about the different glands, like the pituitary, adrenals, thyroid, thymus, pancreas, testes, and ovaries. So you're going to want to know that those are involved in the endocrine system. The cardiovascular or the circulatory system. This is possibly one of the most vital and symbolic systems of the body. It consists of the heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries, all which carry oxygenated or deoxygenated blood throughout the body. It is responsible for many important processes such as regulation of temperature, immune function, and the transportation of nutrients, waste products, hormones, and gases. So it's going to be important to know that the heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries are involved in this system. Respiratory system. This is the system which acts as the basis of respiration. The pulmonary system's mechanism is the exchanging of carbon dioxide and oxygen in and out of the bloodstream via membranes of the lungs known as the alveoli. This chemical exchange is what helps us breathe, regulate blood pH, and oxygenate the body. It's going to be important to know what the system does, such as helping us breathe, regulate pH, and, and oxygenate the body. The digestive system. The digestive system is responsible for the breaking down of food, the absorption of essential amino acids, nutrients, and eliminating waste from the body. There are various acids and enzymes in the stomachs liver, and gallbladder, which each aid in the process of digestion. The various areas of this system include the mouth, esophagus, stomach, intestines, and formerly mentioned organs, liver, gallbladder, etc., with various digestive secretions. So it's going to be important to know that the digestive system, what it does, breaks down food, helps absorb the nutrients, and eliminates the wastes. And also be good to know that it's found in the stomach, liver, and gallbladder. Excretory system. This system is made up of the kidneys, urinary bladder, and ducts which carry urine. It removes wastes from the blood using a complicated, fascinating salt gradient present in actual kidney physiology. This gradient helps the kidneys remove ions such as sodium, chloride, and potassium from the blood. It also regulates blood pH, like the respiratory system, and helps maintain water homeostasis in the body. Reproductive system. This is the system consisting of the ovaries, vagina, mammary glands, and other structures in females, and the testes, prostate gland, penis, and other structures in the males. Sex hormones from the endocrine system are also responsible for many of the processes and mechanisms of the system. This system also produces reproductive cells, eggs and sperm, and in females, it is responsible for fetal development until birth, along with milk production for infants. And there's a picture of the reproductive system for both male and female. Lymphatic system. This system is not well known, but does deserve an important purpose. It provides a one-way route for movement of interstitial fluid to the cardiovascular system. Lymph returns excess fluid filtered from blood vessel capillaries. It is driven mainly by actions of smooth muscle and its circulatory nature allows for the spread of cancer cells. It consists of lymph nodes, lymphatic vessels, spleen, and thymus. It is also harbors various cells such as the T cells and B cells of our immune system. And you're not going to need to know the difference between T cells and B cells. And here's a picture of the lymphatic system. Alright, so pharmacotherapy. When homeostasis is disrupted and disease takes hold, treatment intervention is necessary. There are many ways to correct a disease state beyond the typical treatments of medicine. Today there are numerous trends in alternative medicines tapping into Chinese techniques, chiropractic herbs, and other natural pharmaceuticals, evidence of their effectiveness is always debated, but it could be argued that each health is a state of mind. We will focus, however, on the typical treatments of Western medicine consisting of the following. Lifestyle change. Diet, exercise, and physical environment, such as allergies or pets, etc., have a profound effect on the body's health. 
Physicians use diet and exercise to help accentuate medicinal treatments. Risk factors. Alcohol, illegal drugs, tobacco, and other factors can be eliminated to decrease susceptibility to diseases such as cancer, heart malfunction, disease, etc. Surgery. This treatment can be used to correct or destroy cause of specific diseases. And then there's pharmacotherapy. Using prescription, non-prescription, or alternative medicines to treat disease states. So these are all options or things that the doctor looks at when he wants to try to help you become better or the patient become better. Pharmacokinetics. This is defined as the study of drug movement throughout the body. Doses of drugs are calculated using various mathematical models to gain a desired therapeutic effect. Other therapeutic agents can have a possible toxic effect, which is invariably related relative to every person. What is a proper dosage in one person could be toxic to another. By calculating the correct dosages and trying different therapies or drug regimens, we can lessen toxic effects across the board. So there's four movements of medication throughout the body. The first one is absorption. The process of a drug entering the blood, there are various ways in which they occur, such as inhalers, transdermal patches, or by mouth. The drug is then transported to the blood via active sites. Intravenous dose skips absorption altogether by going straight into the bloodstream. So instead of taking it through your mouth and letting your body metabolize it, it goes straight to the blood. Then there's distribution. The movement of the drug through the blood and into various tissues are cells or cells where it exerts itself. Mathematical equations and models sort the body into various compartments, blood, brain, and fat tissues. The movement of drugs through various compartments is its volume of distribution. Metabolism. The chemical changes a drug undergoes due to being processed by the body. The liver is the main metabolizing organs which contain various enzymes. Processed active agents become metabolites when changed by enzymes into inactive chemical compounds. Drugs interact with one another by its effects on or by specific enzymatic reactions in this system. There are various ways this occurs. The drug goes from an active compound to an inactive metabolite. Others are metabolized into compounds that exert actions on the body. Others are inactive and converted into prodrug or an active chemical compound. <coughs> Excretion. This process through which the drug or its metabolites leave the body, usually in the form of urine, feces, and sometimes the lungs. So once it goes in, it's got to come out, and that's how it comes out. So then there's drug misadventures. It only takes a few minutes of research online to discover the amount of injuries or deaths that have occurred when mistakes are made by physicians, nurses, pharmacists, or pharmacy technicians. These tragedies occur via wrong dose or wrong drugs. Despite the countless well-trained physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and pa patients, errors still occur. As a pharmacy technician, you will also have a hand in prevention. In essence, you act as the eyes and ears of the pharmacy, working to help the pharmacist do the job best job possible. When errors are made, they are known as drug misadventures and consist of the following. Adverse drug reactions. These are expected in a portion of patients on a given drug, as extensions of its desired effects. Sometimes they're referred to as side effects. Then there's anaphylactic allergic reactions, which patients react to a drug as an allergy. An example is penicillin allergies. Then there's prescribing errors. When a physician makes misdiagnose a condition or writes a prescription for the wrong dose, agent, strength, route of administration, or duration of the therapy. Drug misadventures. Dispensing errors. The duties of the pharmacy is to make sure the correct drug is dispensed to the correct patient at the correct time, strength, quantity, and the correct dosage form. If the pharmacy fails to meet all the criteria, an error has occurred. This is going to be the biggest one that a pharmacy technician sees and handles is dispensing errors. So you can prevent the dispensing errors the most. Then there's the administration errors. This occurs at the time when the patient, nurse, or other caregiver makes a mistake in taking or giving the medication to the patient. It also occurs because the patient may fail to take the medication as directed. So I really like how it says the patient may fail to take the medication as directed because sometimes they think that their problem is bigger than someone else's and so they're going to double up on the medication and that is incorrect. So analgesics. Narcotic analgesics. These are used for the relief of pain by binding to opiate receptors in the CNS. What is the CNS? 
The CNS stands for Central Nervous System. That's going to be good to know as well, knowing what CNS stands for. The medications cause drowsiness, depressed respiratory functions, constipation, and should not be taken with alcohol. There is also potential for addiction. Naloxone is a narcotic antagonist sometimes used in narcotic overdoses. So this medication should not be taken with alcohol. So that, that's good to know. So narcotic analgesics are not taken with alcohol. Then there's the non-narcotic analgesics and antipyretics. These are used for, for the reduction of pain and fever, with some agents poss possessing anti-inflammatory effects. These drugs work by inhibiting the synthesis of prostaglandin or by inhibiting the, uh, the substances that sensitize pain receptors to mechanical or chemical stimulation. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. These drugs produce anti-inflammatory, antipyretic fever, and analgesics pain reliever. Effects through inhibition or of prostaglandin synthesis. They are not cock specific and can be damaging to the GI tract. To minimize GI discomfort, take with food or milk. Patients with peptic ulcer disease and GERD should consider other analgesics. Caution should be taken by these patients taking anticoagulants. Now GI tract stands for gastrointestinal and it's going to be important to know that to minimize the GI discomfort, take with food or milk. So this might be one of those labels that you put on, on the prescription or that is automatically put on there. But for the test it'd be good to know and then also it should be cautioned to take with anticoagulants. All right, analgesic COX-2 inhibitors. These drugs are specific for the COX-2 receptors. They are believed to cause little or no GI damage. All right, so that's going to be it for this part. I'm going to go ahead and break it up into two different videos. The next part is going to be the math, and it's going to cover the three different um, math equations that are going to be good to know.